Ladies and gentlemen, the Pennsylvania Literary Festival is proud to present today's keynote presentation by John Dixon and moderated with Heidi Ruby Miller. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for John Dixon. Said hi. I'm, ah. There we go. Hi, I'm John. Thanks for coming out. Um, it is good to see some Seton Hill faces out there. I love Seton Hill. I'm unfortunately not a graduate, but Seton Hill did give me what I needed to take off and start a new career. I taught for many years and uh, always wanted to be a writer, and I lacked a little bit. And by going to Seton Hill, I was able to get that. So I, I'll forever be indebted to Seton Hill for uh, helping me to bump up to that next level. And I, I do want to just point out my former critique partner <laughs> from Seton Hill in the front row, Don Bentley. Uh, he was the guy who, when I would write chapters of this book, when it was you know a computer file, Don would read them and comment on them and make them stronger and keep me out of doing stupid things with firearms. <laughs> so. Uh, we all need our experts when Especially we... Especially our military experts. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, but it's exciting to be here. Thanks, everybody, for turning out. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. And, um, yeah, I thought I would share with you guys the beginning of the book, and then we'll talk about it. Right? Sure. Okay, Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And I'm just starting with the first chapter because I found it would be a, a, good, a good one to start with. So, <laughs> wear, wearing a stiff blue jumpsuit and handcuffs, Carl sat with no expression on his face and waited to see what they were going to do with him this time. They were going to come down hard on him. The judge might even dismiss the case straight to adult court. And then Carl would be looking at jail time, as in real jail, no more juvie, no more boys, men, thieves and rapists and murderers, shanks and gangs, everything. He'd be lucky to survive a month. The Dale County Juvenile Court didn't look like a courtroom. It was just a narrow room with two folding tables set end to end. No judge's dais, no jury box, no spectator's gallery. Just the tables and a dozen or so uncomfortable metal chairs flanking them. Carl smelled new carpet and coffee. Fluorescent lights buzzed in the drop ceiling overhead. A furled American flag leaned in one corner, pinned to the wall by a podium, pushed up against it to make room. He avoided eye contact with his foster parents, who sat at the other end of the table next to Ms. Snyder, the probation officer, and stared instead at his bruised and swollen hands, the scars on his knuckles reading like a twisted road map of the great lengths he'd traveled to arrive here. Out in the hall, somebody laughed in passing. Carl heard keys jingle, a cop probably. The cop in this room looked bored. His leather gun belt creaked as he shifted his weight, watching the judge shuffle through a tall stack of papers. 
Carl's mouth was dry and sour with the waiting. Directly across the table, the judge picked up a white styrofoam cup. Then he put it down and set some papers to one side of the others. Then he looked up. He had watery eyes and deep lines in his face. His hair was a gray mess, and he needed a shave. Despite his robe, he looked more like a burned-out math teacher than a judge. Looking again at the white cup, he finally spoke. Could somebody please get me another cup of coffee? Velma, would you mind? A tall woman said, okay, and stood up and left the room. You are an orphan, the judge said, turning his attention to Carl. Yes, sir. It says here your father was a police officer? Yes, sir. And what does that make you, sir? The sheriff? Chief Watkins snorted. I'm the damn sheriff. Language chief. I'd hate to have to find you in contempt of court. Carl read the men's voices. Just a pair of good old boys having a little fun while they sat one more case together. Chief Watkins nodded. Sorry, Your Honor. That's all right. Then, looking up at Carl, he said, You're a kind of a hard ass, aren't you, son? Chief Watkins cleared his throat. It's all right, Chief. It's my court. I'll be in contempt if I see fit. Answer the question, son. You fasten yourself a hard ass? Carl shrugged. I don't mean to be. You don't mean to be. No, sir. And you know what that sounds like to me? No, sir. That sounds like every kid who comes in here. He looked at the paper. It says here you're a boxer. Carl nodded. I was. Chief Watkins used to box a little, didn't you, Chief? A few smokers back in the Navy, nothing official. The judge said, our friend here had more than a few fights. How many was it all together, son? 87, Carl said. And out of those 87 matches, how many did you win? 85. The judge raised his shaggy brows. That is a good record. Were you a champion? Yes, sir. What sort of champion? 75, 90, 114. The judge tilted his head, then grinned a little. No, son, I'm not talking weight classes. I meant what level of champion? City, state, national? Carl nodded. All three? <laughs> yes, sir. Junior Golden Gloves, PAL, AAU. Officer Watkins' gun belt creaked as he leaned back. That's pretty good. Carl relaxed a little. Talking boxing did that. Made him feel like more than just a throwaway kid awaiting sentencing. Still, he could tell this judge viewed himself as a shoot-from-the-hip kind of guy. A judge like this, he might throw you in a dungeon for life or let you go scot-free. Either way, just to see the look on your face. The judge said, when I asked if you were a boxer, you said was rather than is. Is that correct? Yes, sir, was. Was, then. Have you retired? It's just I keep moving so much. I haven't been able to fight the box for a while. Indeed. Velma returned and handed the judge's coffee. Thank you, dear, he said. Mr. and Mrs. Rhodes, are you sure you all wouldn't like some coffee? All right, then. Do you all have anything you'd like to say? Carl's new foster parents looked nervous. He wondered if they had ever been in a courtroom before. Probably not. He felt bad dragging them in. Mr. Rhodes had almost certainly missed work, and Carl could see Mrs. Rhodes had been crying. She told the judge they hadn't known Carl long, but he'd been a good boy, very respectful, and Mr. Rhodes nodded. Listening to them, Carl felt a renewed pang of loss. Things could have been good here, really good. The judge thanked them, rippled through his papers, and said, Carl, why did you hurt these boys? Carl cleared his throat before saying, they wouldn't stop. Could you elaborate, please? I'm trying to decide your fate right now, and I'd like to think I gave you a chance to share your side of the story. I don't know how it is back in Philadelphia, but it's not every day I deal with a kid who's beaten up half the football team. Wouldn't you agree, Chief Watkins? Yes, Your Honor, I'd say this is downright idiosyncratic.
Idiosyncratic, yes. So, Carl, do you mind telling me a little more about whatever it was that led up to this unfortunate incident? I was just sitting there eating my lunch, and then I heard him laughing, and I looked over, and I saw this one kid, I think his name was Brad, picking on this little kid, Eli something. Yes, the judge said. Eli Berenger and Brad Templeton. Brad's home from the hospital now, in case you were wondering. His jaw is wired shut. He'll be sipping breakfast, lunch, and dinner through a straw for the next six months, according to his father. Did you know them, sir? The judge asked questions like a slick boxer used a jab. You never saw him coming, and just when you thought you'd found your rhythm, he knocked you off balance again. This boy, Eli, for instance, was he a friend of yours? No, sir. You just decided to defend him then. And did you know Brad Templeton? No, sir. What I'm trying to comprehend is why you would do something like this. No grudge to settle, no attachment to the victim. Why don't you tell me a little bit about more, more about how it happened, maybe even why? I don't know. Carl remembered Eli's thick glasses, his hunched body, and worst of all, his smile, his braces full of white bread and peanut butter. I just, I don't like bullies. I mean, I can't stand them. They're making fun of this kid, and he's sitting there laughing because he didn't know what was going on. And everybody kept laughing at him, so I got up and walked over and told him to stop. By them, you are referring to Brad Templeton? Yes, sir. Interesting choice of words, them. This is not the first time something like this has happened. Carl shook his head. I've read your record, son. Took me a good portion of yesterday evening. And I must say, to employ Chief Watkins' terminology, that I've found your history rather idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. They looked at each other for a second, and the judge said, Carl, you've been in 18 different placements in the last four years. And that's not counting short stays, like the place where you got that jumpsuit you're wearing. Eighteen. A dozen and a half foster homes, group homes, and juvenile detention facilities in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, and, he glanced down at the papers, Idaho. How was Idaho? Cold, sir. Cold, yes, I'd imagine. You've accumulated one of the longest rap sheets I've ever seen in a juvenile, and you've only just turned 16, and yet something stands out to me. They are all, every last one of them, the same charge, assault, each stemming from the same sort of situation that brought you before me. Someone gave someone else a hard time, and you took it upon yourself to teach him a lesson. Good God, son, I lost track of how many people you have assaulted. And it's not just other children. Oh, no, you punched foster parents and teachers and mall security. Sorry about that. And, <laughs> and even a police officer. A police officer? Son, don't you have a brain? Carl looked down. He had some skateboarder up against the monkey bars, and he kept yelling at the kid and slamming him into the bars. So stop, the judge said. There is no so when you don't like something a police officer is doing. You had no role in that situation. You're lucky he didn't shoot you. I would have shot you. Chief, wouldn't you have shot him? Hands like that, yeah, I'd shot him. <laughs> Carl wished the two had dropped the cutesy act and get down to business. The longer he sat here, the more it felt like disaster brewing. The judge said, I don't know whose decision it was to move you all the way down here to North Carolina and drop you into Jessup High. But I intend to find out, and I further intend to have his hide nailed to my shed by sundown. He glanced at Velma, and she nodded and made a note on a clipboard. You are a rare person, Carl Freeman. Other than your fighting, your record is absolutely spotless. No theft, no drugs, no underage drinking. If it weren't for the fighting, you'd look like a candidate for the glee club. <laughs> Carl had heard all this before. I don't look for trouble if they would just stop. The judge tended his fingers and narrowed his eyes. Very interesting, Carl. Very interesting indeed. You said it again. They. Do you feel these people, Brad, the policemen in Ohio, are all in this together? Part of a club or something? 
I'm not crazy. The judge tapped the stack of the papers before him. Your record implies otherwise, I'm afraid. Either you are insane or at very least downright idiosyncratic. It's like you have a superhero <laughs> complex or something. Mild-mannered schoolboy by day, raging lunatic by night. Heat rose through Carl's chest and into his face, and his knuckles began to ache again. Why didn't anybody understand? If I don't stop them, nobody will. Not the kids, not the teachers, nobody. Everybody just sits back and watches. The kids pretend they think it's funny because they're too scared to say anything, and the teachers pretend they don't see it because they're too lazy to do anything. What am I supposed to do? Lower your voice, Chief Watkins said. He was still leaned back with his big forearms crossed over his chest, but his eyes bore hard into Carl's. The judge patted the air. That's okay, Chief. I'm glad the boy's letting his hair down. Then to Carl, he said, now, these boys you attack, Brad Templeton and the others, they're well known in my community. Put on car washes, sell candy door to door. You might know the type. Their mothers and fathers, I see them at the Elks Club on Friday evenings. In the fall, we show up a bit later on Friday nights. See, football is quite popular here in our little corner of the world. Disturbingly so, in fact. It approaches religion at times. You can see the sort of trouble you've caused me. Carl nodded, thinking, here it comes. The jabbing's over. Here comes the KO punch. The judge continued. Jessup's football season is over before it even got going. The boys with broken noses will be OK. But the ones with busted ribs and wired jaws are out for the season. There on that team are other kids, good kids, counting on football scholarships. Who will even scout a team with a record Jessup's going to have this year? No one. That's who. So these boys, instead of going on to college, they'll just mow lawns and load cases of beer into people's trunks for the rest of their lives. The judge stared directly into Carl's eyes, and for the first time, Carl saw anger there. These are the real victims of your crime. They might not even know it, but I know it, and you know it and their parents know it. The town is screaming for your blood, son. They'd like to string you up on the 50-yard line and feed what's left to the pigs. I'm sorry about those other kids. Carl lowered his head. He was sorry. They had never even crossed his mind. Worse still, he wasn't sure he could have stopped himself even if they had. I believe you are sorry. Sorry about them, I mean. But what interests me is are you sorry about the other boys, too, the ones that hurt you? Carl remembered the deep green mountainside beyond the cafeteria windows, rags of fog lifting away like departing ghosts, a strange world far from home, everything darkness and void. Remembered the boys, their cruelty, their laughter when he told them to stop. Remembered the fight, all of them coming at him, and then kids on the floor, bleeding, Carl turning himself in. He raised his eyes and shook his head. The judge's mouth went thin. I didn't think so. While I commend your honesty, I must publicly acknowledge that a criminal who shows no remorse for his crimes is, of course, a criminal likely to perpetrate those same crimes in the future. With those hands of yours, I could charge you with assault with a deadly weapon. Eight counts. Forget juvenile detention center. Chief Watkins would drive you straight to the state penitentiary where you'd serve out a sentence of, oh, a decade or two, right alongside full-grown men. Does that sound good to you? No, sir. Or I could hand you over to Windy Pines. They'd put you in a padded cell, drug you up so heavy, you wouldn't be able to tie your own shoes. Do you like the sounds of that? No, sir. Trouble is, I have to live with whatever decision I make here today, and despite your singular idiosyncrasy, I believe you have the potential to become a good man someday. Your father was killed in the line of duty. He died as a result of wounds sustained in the line of duty. If it sounded like a line Carl had said before, it was, many times. The judge sighed. Carl, it is my belief that you are at the present time, regardless of your potential, incapable of controlling your temper should the aforementioned situation arise again. Carl nodded. 
Judges in the past have taken every approach from absolute leniency to draconian severity. Nothing has worked, and yet you have within you this potential. Even your criminal acts have a certain nobility about them, as if you ascribe to a higher code than the rest of humanity. But make no mistakes, they are crimes. In light of this factors, the nature and number of your crimes, your seeming inability to control your temper, and the positive potential I see in every other aspect of your character and behavior, I hereby sentence you to Phoenix Island, a military-style boot camp, a term of confinement to begin immediately and to end at the date of your 18th birthday, at which point in time you will either return to North Carolina to serve out the remainder of your sentence, a term of six months to three years at the state penitentiary, or you will earn placement through Phoenix Island, at which time this court will declare your debt paid in full and will furthermore expunge your juvenile record. Carl swallowed with difficulty, jail or freedom, everything or nothing in between. There is no parole from Phoenix Island. It is a terminal facility, meaning you will remain there until you are legally an adult. Fail to learn from this opportunity, and I predict you will spend the rest of your life in and out of prison. If, however, you make the most out of this situation and learn to give others a second chance, just as I have given you a chance here today, you will be able to lead a good life as a productive member of our society. You will get control of that temper, that temper of yours, and I think you'd make one hell of a cop. Thank you, sir. The judge looked Carl dead in the eyes. There will come a day, son, when you will need to determine exactly who it is you intend to be. Yes, sir. The judge finished his coffee, set the empty cup on Carl's file, and turned to the others. Questions? Miss Snyder asked for the location and visiting hours. Yeah, right, Carl thought. If there were two things you learned as an orphan, there were endings and beginnings. Mr. and Mrs. Rhodes were no more likely to visit than were Carl's dead parents. The judge closed the matter. I'm afraid that's confidential, Ms. Snyder, and irrelevant as well. Phoenix Island allows no contact with the outside world. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. You mentioned boxing quite a few times in there. And you have a bit of a background. And he has a bit of a Union Count connection with boxing, which I thought was a great story. Yeah, it's an unfortunate uh, <laughs> truth. I've been to Uniontown before once, and it was 20-some years ago, and I got whooped. <laughs> I fought the Pittsburgh Golden Glove champ here, and I had a moment when I was walking through the hotel last night, and uh, they had the, the pool, and I remember the weigh-ins of the fight before the fight were held beside a drained pool. And I, sorry, uh. I just, and, uh, yeah, so it's not a fond memory, you know. Uh, so this is uh, redemption. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, when you have Carl as a character, did you frame Carl from some part of yourself, or did you use amalgam of other archetypes? Yeah, um, I mean, I think every, every character we write is, has to do with us or somebody we know, and probably a blend of both, but I mean, he was really, he was just, I, I wanted to write a story about a kid who was really tough, and who, rather than so many characters, uh, teenage characters in books, when the going gets tough, and the, the kids either get snarky or they look to their team to solve the problem. I wanted somebody who was a problem solver who would throw himself right into danger at great expense to himself because I, you know, I think that a lot of younger readers in particular want to read that. They want to read the, the active main character fighting it out and, and taking the shots. Right. Himself. It makes him a very sympathetic character right Thanks. off the bat. We understand he does something wrong, but... We understand why he did it, and yeah, he's a he's a good kid with a bad temper, you know. So that's that's how I think of Carl. Oh, mm. that's awesome. Now, the question on everyone's mind is the TV show when yeah. you because that before the book was published, they had actually um, sold the TV rights. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, that is correct. So you know, it's really tough to find a good publisher. It really is, um, and there are a million great books out there that haven't found the right home yet. And um, in my case, it was taking a little while. You know, I had found an awesome agent, and then she had gotten me an awesome film agent. And so I, I had high hopes, but I didn't 
you know, little encouragement beyond that. We would get what I would call rave rejections from like Random House. So Random House, love, 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 sorry. Doesn't fit our list. And, and, and I, so I was starting to worry. And I was in the, the rare situation where my film rights to the TV show sold before my book did. And, um, it, you know, I, I, like I said, there's so many great books out there that haven't sold yet. And in my case, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would have found the right home or not if I, if I hadn't have, you know, had the break in the film side. Because I know there are just so many great books out there. Um, and it was, it was exciting and it was surprising. And um, What was it like that when you got the call? What was that like? I cannot imagine. Well, I've told this story before <laughs> because it's funny. Um, <laughs> I was at my favorite restaurant in the world, which is a place called Jimmy John's Hot Dogs. It's not the chain, Jimmy John's. It's this little roadside stop near That's my house. That's your favorite restaurant is, in the world. It is. <laughs> and I've been there many times since to celebrate anything good with the books. So I, I got a call on the, way to the, on, the, on the way to the hot dog shop, and it was from my film agent, and he had never called me before. I knew he was sort of like working in the back. And um, he said, okay, there's been interest in the book, and this executive producer, known for all his movies, his name's Trip Vinson, he did, you know, Journey to the Sun of the Earth, number 23 with Jim Carrey. He started rattling off all these feature films. He goes, he's going to, he wants to call you. And I thought he meant that we were going to talk in a few days because everything is sort of like set up ahead of time and everything. And I said, okay, great. And I thought, this is going to be the best tasting hot dog I've ever had. I don't remember what it tastes like. It's like when I got <laughs> there and got the hot dog, I took about a bite and the phone rings. Now, to set the stage, Jimmy John's is, this is why I love it, it's this little old sort of traditional diner, and it's got trains all over the place. There's a train around the ceiling. There's a train <laughs> at the center. There's a train right by my head where I was. And it also has lots and lots of children. And the kids are all running around with these little whistles that they sell. At, so it is the loudest, happiest place, and not the best place to take a life-changing call. So I got a call on this. I could hear, barely hear a woman say, yes, I have Trip Vincent on the phone for you. And I thought, holy crap, this is, this is the call that I'm not expecting. And I couldn't hear anything. So I started doing that thing where you, you know, okay, yes, oh, uh, yes, okay, great, great. And I, and I go rushing out of the restaurant and sit in my truck. And I'm, I'm alongside this busy road. And, you know, cars and Mack trucks are zooming by and shaking and everything. But it was great. So I got the call. And, and he, at that point, of course, he was, it was just the producer. We didn't have CBS or anything like that. So he just uh, he said, look, I, I really like your book. I think we could do something with it. Why don't you come up to New York? He was in LA. He was going to fly out. And I hopped on the train. And yeah, so we, we went and met. It was great. Wow. I was super nervous when I first met him, understandably. <laughs> and it was at the Trump Soho. And I'm you know more of a Motel 6 type of guy. And I walk in, and this, this place was so fancy. And <clears throat> And you know, I hadn't even sold the book yet. I just was like, I'm sure they didn't make a mistake. And I go walking up, and he wasn't there yet. So my nervousness is building until they had this beautiful area full of books. And I walk back into the back, and spread open on a display case was an oversized book about boxing. And it was oh. open, yeah. And it was open to Ali Norton which was the first fight I ever saw. Oh ever. my gosh. Yeah, and I looked at that and I swear, I was like, I was like, this is gonna be okay. You know, I had no idea that it was gonna go on to actually wow. work out to be a series and everything, but at that moment I felt comfortable. Kind of like Carl when he, they start talking boxing, and I felt like it was a message or something. And I thought, okay, well, everything's gonna cool. be okay. Huh, that's like almost serendipity. Yes. You're looking for that sign and you found yeah, that. Yeah, it was there. Well, that is awesome. And then whenever you finally found out that it was going to be picked up as a series, as I recall, you found out when you weren't supposed to. Right, yeah. Um, so it was a long time. It took a year, almost to the day. So we met in May, and, um, and he told me at that time, he was great. He gave me great advice. He said, look, this is a long shot. Chances are it's not going to work out. Um, and we have so many hurdles to cross along the way. You know, we have to get a writer, we have to get a director, we have to get a cast, we have to sell the idea to a, um, to a studio, and then we have to sell the idea to a network that will actually air it. So there are a million ways for it to go wrong. He said, never pin your happiness on whether or not it happens. 
That's smart. Cele yeah, it is smart. Writers have to learn early. You must manage your expectations about everything. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it was a long time, and we celebrated every hurdle. And um, I went to Jimmy John's. Every time something good happened, I became superstitious, <laughs> ate a hot dog, <laughs> grinned. And, um, a then sports guy becoming superstitious. Who would guess? <laughs> and then at the end, yeah, when we found out that it was going to be uh, turned into the show for CBS, which was you know, absolutely life-changing, um, uh, we were supposed to find out on May 15th, but on the evening of May 10th, following a pretty rough week, um, I was standing there talking to my wife. She had had a horrible work week, and I was talking to her about that and some other stuff, and all of a sudden I get an email on my phone, and I looked down, and, and it said, it was from a friend in, in Hollywood who works in the business, and she said, um, in case you hadn't heard, and I opened it up, and it says CBS buys intelligence. Now, at this point, we knew we weren't being bought. I mean, it was obvious that the other pilots were, were favored. So I didn't believe it. And the other reason I didn't believe it was we weren't so su supposed to find out until the 15th. So I literally looked at it, and I showed it to my wife, and she goes, no, nah, that's not true. And <laughs> we didn't believe it. And then as we're both saying it's not true, I get an email from my film agent, Joe Veltri, and it says, so happy for you, John. Oh. It was another link to, this, to the same uh, message, but a different article, like on the Hollywood Insider or, or something. And, and all of a sudden, I, I just, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it, you know? Oh, I bet. So um, then the book came out on January 7th, the same day that the show premiered. And uh, so, it's, yeah, it's been really great. It's been a lot of fun. Met a lot of great people. Visited the set. Came here. Oh, how fun was that, visiting the set? Lots of fun. Yeah, they filmed in, a, in an abandoned insane asylum. Man. And we Where's shot Stephanie at night. Where's She should be all yeah, over Well, I them. told her about yeah. it last <laughs> night. She, she would have been right at home. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was crazy because we drove in, and it was about 8 at night, and it was sort of rainy outside of Vancouver in Canada where they did the pilot huh. before switching to L.A. for the um, show. And they had these massive lights shining up on the asylum and generators, and I didn't know what was going on. So we go in, and everybody was super nice to us, and we get inside, and the one guy, he's walking us through the set and explaining how everything works. And I said, hey, what's the deal with those lights? And he goes, oh, well, we have to shoot a daylight scene today, and the way it works out, we have to shoot it in at night. Oh and they were gosh. creating daylight, and I thought, this is way bigger than anything wow. than anything I'd ever. And my wife's big moment, as I tell people, for <laughs> going to the going to the set was when Josh Holloway smiled at her. And I, and it's like, you know, it's your husband's dream come true. She's uh, like, uh, yeah. She's like, guess what just happened? I'm like, Josh Holloway, the the star from Lost. He just smiled at me. I was like, okay, that's great. I'm happy. I'm glad the trip was worth for you, worth it for you. Yeah. So. Oh, that's fun. That is every writer's dream. And um, most people don't realize that it's not like it was an overnight success. Not at all. It always seems that way because sometimes whenever things happen, they happen very fast. And sometimes it's because the general public has not heard of you up to that point. Right. So they think that you've just come out of nowhere. But tell us a little bit about your career pre-Phoenix Island. Yeah, I'm actually really happy you asked that because um, for as cool as it is for people to go, wow, it's your first book, and you, know, you had all this happen, isn't that exciting? I'm like, yeah. There's a part of me that's going, oh, because I wrote for many years. I earned 500 rejection letters as a short story writer, um, and I learned a lot from the feedback of editors. Um, you know, you, there, you just you pay your dues, and you have to, you know, I, I would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day, uh, and right before I taught, I taught middle school, and if, if you've ever spent any extended period of time around middle school children, they're wonderful, and you're not able to write when you leave. So, um, <laughs> so I had to do what I had to do, and, and yeah, for years I, I did that. And I, I really decided when I got to a, a certain point, I felt like I had hit a level of competency, but I needed something else. So I decided to really double down, and um, that's when I went to Seton Hill, and I threw everything into that. And I took a sabbatical from work on half pay, and my, my, my wife was awesome. She supported me on that. She's like, yeah, you know, go for it. The timing's right. And, you know, it was a blessing it worked out. So, but it, it, was, it was a long, long, hard haul, and I, you know, I, I needed every minute of it to learn, you know, to get where I ended up. That's good. That's important, I think, for people to hear, especially aspiring writers, oh, yeah. to know that everything that you do still has purpose. 
even if it seems like it's a rejection, it, it is still all building toward that wonderful point. And you mentioned about how your wife is very supportive. Yeah. That is wonderful. And that also is extremely important to have the people around you support you as a writer because so many times I, I hear other writers who are talking about either, well, my spouse has never read anything that I wrote, or they have, well, my family doesn't understand, and I barely get 15 minutes to myself to be able to sit down and write something, um, or they don't have a group, even like the Seton Hill community that we keep talking about. Um, other writers understand what other writers are going through, and I think sometimes people look at writers as just being in competition with one another. But yeah, it's a horrible idea. Yeah, that it is. It's it is much more about community. If you are all into the community of it, you can find the support group that makes everything so much easier. Yeah, it's it's impossible to exaggerate how important the other people in our lives are for most writers. And I, I just, when I think about the incredible sacrifices I've asked my wife to make over the years, um, in terms of time and in, you know just. I mean, I, I can't even calculate it because all those years of my getting up earlier probably disrupted her sleep and I was probably edgier than I would have been if I had slept those extra couple of hours and just again and again and again and I, it, it forces me to work as hard as I can because I feel like if I've asked her to, you know, pay more of the bills while I'm on half, on half pay and, and to just put up with my writing and, and also encourage me on top of it, like I have to succeed. <laughs> You know, I just, and if, if I don't succeed, I have to work my hardest. I want to, you know, I, I want to go down. I want to die with my boots on. You know, I'm going to work hard. But friends and family and anybody who's come up to me and said, hey, I read your book and I really liked it. Like, it just happened today. And I said, I'll never get tired of hearing that. Because it, I don't care who you are. I, I think that most writers out there, no matter how many successes they've had, right. I mean, it's, a long, it's a long haul writing. It's a really, like, any type of encouragement friends who take the time to go and show up when you when you're going to do something I mean that really all the way in from Texas <laughs> in Jersey and you know it just I, I'm eternally grateful you know so and and then having the having the fellowship of writers really puts you on a faster track you know, I, I wrote in seclusion for a decade so going and meeting other writers is great Definitely. Um, we were going to take uh, couple of audience questions if anyone had any. If not, I can just keep asking you questions all day. How are we on time? What is it? Oh, we're over. Oh, we're over. We are over. Well, apparently we have just really talked John to death at this point, but it has been a lot of fun. Um, if you do I have any questions for John, though, and if you would like to purchase one of his books and have him sign it and have a photo taken with him, his um, table is right over there. And Carrie, raise your hand, Carrie. Carrie, it would be the start of the line. So you can just go over to Carrie and you can line up there. And